We have to know who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu is, uh, he is an embodiment of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you know the Prophet sallallahu then you know something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the points of fasting is la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we quoted this ayah, we quote it all the time, that fasting is prescribed upon you uh, as it was prescribed uh, upon those before you. La'allakum tattaqoon. And we said that something is known by its objective. And so therefore the objective of fasting is taqwa. So fasting is a great thing. To be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is taqwa. And part of being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being conscious of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our fellow human beings. Right? To have empathy. So one of the reasons why we fast then is to empathize with the poor, with the needy. These are people who don't eat every day. They have to fast every day. They don't have a choice. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we have a choice, right? Uh, and we fast. So when we increase with, in our empathy, uh, that increases our compassion. And when, our, when our compassion increases, then we become more and more like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala describes it, فَلَعَلَكَ بَاخِيُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ You're almost killing yourself over grief over them. This is how much it affected him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. حَدِيثٌ عَلَيْكُمْ لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِمْ عَنِبْتُمْ Right? حَدِيثٌ عَلَيْكُمْ That there has come unto you a messenger from amongst yourselves. Uh, it grieves him that you should perish. Deeply concerned is he about you. And there's no تَخْسِيس in this part of the ayah. Which means that basically this applies to the whole of humanity. The Prophet ﷺ as concerned for the whole of humanity. And then بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ And this applies to the the Muslims. So one of the ways in which we can increase in our ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to study our aqidah. So I brought a text, the Tahawiyah. This is the text, the creed of Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. The basic matan or treatise uh, of the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So I thought we'd read some of this inshallah ta'ala to get to know who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you study different ulum, different sciences, sacred sciences, aqidah is primary. So there's there's something called the, the ten mabadi, right? The ten principles of every science. They say, what is the, the hukum shari'i? What is istimdaduhu? What is it called? What are its supports? Uh, what's the fadl? What's the uh, the result? What's the, the merit of studying? So we have to know some basic aqidah as Muslims. This is far ala kulli muslim. This is uh, obligatory upon every Muslim to know something about the basic aqidah, something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So aqidah is a word aqada, which means to tie or bind something, right? Uh, so for example, the, uh, the, the beautiful dua of Musa alayhi wa sallam, when he was at the uh, shajara, what did he say? Qadra bishrahli sadri wa yasili amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani, uqdah. Right? So un untie the knot from my tongue. Right? This is from the root aqidah. So aqidah then, aqidah means something that is binding us, something that ties us down. Uh, it's binding for us to believe in certain things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to believe in them. Right? And aqidah uh, uh, formulas or articulations are the strongest when it comes to sources. So the aqidah is based on the Qur'an, primarily. What does the Qur'an say? The Qur'an is concealed, uh, uh, considered to be a definitive proof. It's called Dalil Qat'i. And then also, Mutawatir Hadith, multiply attested Hadith. Right? What is a multiply attested Hadith? That means groups and groups of Muslims from all around the Muslim world are reporting the same thing from the Prophet which would have made it impossible for them to have uh, collaborating in order to fabricate something about the Prophet right? It's multiply attested. It's just simply known, right? And then also the ijma of the Salaf, the first three generations of the Muslims. Some some people say the first four generations. These are called the Salaf, and the ijma is consensus of what they taught their students. This is what Aqidah is based on. Okay. So he begins here by saying, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, after Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
And then he says, قال العلامة حجة الإسلام أبو جعفر الوراء التحاوي Now he's going to quote, this is the introduction here. What does Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi say? Bin Misr, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he was from Egypt. هذا ذكر بياني عقيدة أهل السنة والجماعة على مذهب فقهاء الملة أبي حليف النعمان بن ثابت الكوفي. So basically his introduction here, he's saying that this is an explication of the aqidah, right? The belief, the creed of the people of the prophetic precedent and the majority. This is called Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? And Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, he's Hanafi in his fiqh. So he's a, one of the direct students of Numan ibn Thabit, who's Abu Hanifa. Wa Abi Yusuf Ya'qub ibn Ibrahim al-Ansari. Wa Abi Abdullah Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaytani. Ridwanullahi alayhim ijma'in. So basically, this is the creed of Abu Hanifa and his two top students. The two top students of Abu Hanifa or Qadi Abu Yusuf ibn Ibrahim and Shaykh Muhammad al-Shaybani. Okay? <coughs> this is an accepted creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So then he says, وَقَالَ الْإِمَامُ بِهِ قَالَ الْإِمَامَانِ مَذْكُرَانِ So the Imam said, and the aforementioned two Imams, Abu Yusuf and uh, Muhammad al-Shaybani, نَقُولُ فِي تَوْحِيدِ اللَّهِ We say uh, in believing in the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Tawheed mean? Tawheed, this is a mustard on the second form. It means oneness. It means monotheism. This is absolutely imperative for Muslims to believe in Tawheed. What does it mean to believe in Tawheed? He's going to go into that. But one of the things that we know as Muslims is that a Muslim who was a Muwahid believes that all strength and power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Nothing, nobody. Nobody, nothing, has any strength whatsoever except by means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, uh, when we walk around, when we eat, all of these things, these mundane things that we do on a daily basis, all of these things are by the permission and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to, He can very easily take that away from us. Right? So we're, we're floating on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the meanings of Tawheed. Inna Allah wahidun la sharika laha. This is the first point. So there's about a hundred and some odd points that he mentions here. Let me see if I can get the exact number. 130 points. 130 points. The first one is Inna Allah wahidun la sharika laha. Verily Allah is one and he has no partner. Okay? So like the Christians say, yes, Allah is wahid. That's what they believe. They'll say that. They say, La ilaha illallah, I've heard them. They say, Alhamdulillah, Allah is one, right? What? But, La sharika la, he does not have a partner. The Christian also will say that Isa alayhi salam, he shares, he's a sharik with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Isa alayhi salam has omniscience, he knows everything, he has ilm mutlaq, he has qudra mutlaq. This is what they believe, this is shirk, right? So it's not just enough to say, Allah is wahid, right? You have to believe that he shares none of his attributes with anybody. No one has divine attributes. It doesn't matter how great they are. The Prophet ﷺ is the best of creation. He does not have divine attributes. Nothing, nobody. Jibreel ﷺ, no, nothing. Has divine attributes except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is our Tawheed. So Allah is one, right? And he's Ahad. Right? There's a difference between Wahid and Ahad. Qul huwa Allah Ahad. What is the difference? Because the Arabs at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they believed uh, in many gods, right? They're polytheistic. This is called polytheism, right? But many of the Arabs, although they believed in these other gods, they only worshipped Allah. So is this Tawheed? No, it's not Tawheed. Right? They believed in other gods, these Ali had, they said, yeah, those are gods, but we're only going to worship Allah. This is not called monotheism. This is called henotheism. People who I want to take notes. Henotheism means you believe in many gods, but you only worship one. Right? So this is not Tawheed. Tawheed is believing Allah is Ahad. What is Ahad? One and only unique. One of a, gen of a genus. There's only one God. There's only one entity who is Ilah, and that is Allah. There's no other Ilah. Right? 
So we would use this example a lot when we did the tafsir of surah al ikhlas. If I say, for example, Ana rajulun wahid, I am one man, right? That doesn't mean that you're not one man, you're also rajulun wahid, right? All of you are rajulun wahid. But if I say, Ana rajulun ahad, that means there's no other rajul on earth. There's no other rajul in creation. I'm the only man. So I use the word ahad, right? La sharika la. He does not share in any of his attributes, his sifat, his ifat, his essence, his af'al, his actions. No one shares in these things. Okay? He says, Wala shay'a mithru. There is nothing like him whatsoever. It's based on the hadith, uh, uh, the verse in the Quran, Laysa ki mithrihi shayhu. Laysa ki mithrihi shayhu. Right? And when we talk about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we usually use a negating verb or particle. Right? It's called negative theology. Why do we use negative theology via negativa? Why do we say that? Because when we talk about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can only say what it is not, not what it is. We don't know what it is. We have no idea. We can even possibly comprehend what is the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can use positive uh, descriptions. Positive. He is the most powerful. He is all-knowing. Uh, he has uh, absolute will. Those are powerful, positive descriptions of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about Allah's essence, we can only go the way of the negative. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدٍ Right? So, ولا, ولا شيء مثله ولا شيء يعجزه Nothing can debilitate him. Nothing makes him weak. Right? Like Fir'aun who said, I am God. Fir'aun, uh, he used to eat bananas. According, there's some stories about Fir'aun. That he would only eat bananas. Why did he only eat bananas? Because he wanted to become constipated. Why would he want to do that? Because he didn't like going to the bathroom. He said, I, I'm God. This is beneath me. I don't want to go to the bathroom anymore. So we eat bananas, this type of thing. Right? Nothing debilitates Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Christians, they say, Isa alayhi salam, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is their orthodox position. 99% right? of Christians, they believe this. If you read the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, Isa alayhi salam is in the city of Jerusalem. He sees a fig tree in the distance. He goes to take some figs and he notices that it's not fig season. Right? So he doesn't know something. If a prophet doesn't know something, if a person doesn't know something, then automatically they're excluded as being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. A leaf doesn't fall without the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So nothing can debilitate him. He's never ajiz. Right? Uh, there is no God except Him. This is point number four. There is no God except Him. And there's a difference between Ilah and Rabb. A God and a Lord. So Ilah, the ulama say, this is a reference to a God that is transcendent. Right? A God that is transcendent, that is removed. It's called Ilah. So this approximates a belief called Deism. The founding fathers of America, the vast majority, we're not Christian. This is a misconception. Right? You know how they sometimes they turn on Fox News and they say, these Muslims want to implement Sharia law in a Christian country. It's not a Christian country. In fact, this country was founded to be the very opposite of a Christian country. One of the founding principles of this country is not to be a Christian country. Not to imitate what was happening in Europe. Right? Christendom, that was Europe. What was happening in England with King George, the, the Anglican Church, that would persecute scientists, Sir Isaac Newton, he was a monotheist uh, uh, Christian. He was not a Trinitarian. Right? He was a Unitarian Christian. But he couldn't express that because that was a death sentence. They would kill him for blasphemy. This is in England during the time of the, the Founding Fathers. Right? So the Treaty of Tripoli makes it very clear the Treaty of Tripoli was signed into law by President John Adams in 1797. It says, and I quote, the United States of America was in no way founded 
as a Christian nation. It's not a Christian country. It's a secular country. Separation of church and state. Right? Anyway. So, many of the, the first six presidents, they were not Orthodox Christians. They were deists, which means they believed in sort of this Neoplatonic concept of God, that God created everything, but he has nothing to do with his creation. He's utterly removed and transcendent. Right? This is a God. Ilah. But then Rab, what does Rab mean? Rab means your cherisher, your sustainer. So this is God imminent. Right? God removed and God close to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both of these. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is utterly transcendent. There's nothing like him whatsoever. He's utterly transcendent. But he's also close to us, meaning that there's a relational aspect we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know this? He says in the Quran, when my servants ask you concerning me, say, I'm close, I'm qareeb. Right? We are closer to the human being than his jugular vein. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent and he's imminent at the same time. He's a personal deity. Right? So that's the difference between ilah and rab. Qadimun bila imtida'in. Da'imun bila intiha'in. So he says here he is pre existent without origin, eternal without end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first without a beginning. And you think to yourself, how can that be? Right? How can he be first without a beginning? And the reason that we can't conceive of it uh, intellectually is because we live in a linear world. We live in the temporal world. And in the temporal world, uh, we, tr we think in terms of once upon a time, and then they live happily ever after. Beginning and an end. Right? We cannot possibly conceive of how an entity is outside of time. How can someone be outside of time? It doesn't make sense to us. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because nothing is like him, right? therefore he's dependent on nothing. Allah subhanahu wa means he is totally independent. Therefore he even transcends time. He's not in time. Right? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not, you know, whatever, for Ramadan, 13, 1434 Hijri. That's not the date. There's no date with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of time. Right? Inna hu kana tawaba. Kana is past tense. Right? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe himself in the past tense? Kana is an interesting verb. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses kana to describe himself, it means past, present, and future. Right? So he's metachronic. He transcends time. And this is how we solve this issue of infinite regression. You guys know what this means? What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first? You say the chicken came first. But the chicken came out of an egg. But the egg came first. Who laid the egg? It doesn't make any sense. You can go back ad infinitum, right? This is called infinite regression, right? And we can't solve it because when we think of chicken and eggs, we're thinking of things that are creatures like us that are dependent on time. Right? They're dependent on time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not dependent on time. So how do we solve this riddle of infinite regression? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He always was. Allah who can. Qabla al Was zaman. Allah just was. Before time and space. He's qadim. Right? He's pre-existent. Again, the Christians say, Isa is also pre-existent. This is shirk. This is not wahdaniya. This is not monotheism. He is the da'imun. Uh, he is the eternal without an end. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has al-qidr al-dhati. An essential pre-eternality that nobody else has. No one else has al-qidr al-dhati. He's also... He also has this attribute of baqa. Baqa means that he lasts forever. Right? He lasts forever because that's part of his nature, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can also give this attribute to his creation. He can grant it to his creation to live forever. Because Jannah lasts forever. It doesn't come to an end. Right? And we're going to be, inshallah ta'ala, when we enter Jannah, uh, we're never going to perish. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this attribute of baqa, everlasting
craftedness, right? Uh, to, or immortality, you can say, to some of his creation that he will. Uh, then he says, لا يفنى ولا يبيد, that he doesn't uh, perish and he doesn't become extinct or obsolete, right? Uh, he doesn't become annihilated. كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك. Everything else becomes annihilated. Everything else is annihilated except the countenance of your Lord, Subhanahu wa Taala. So again, we compare this to Christianity. The Christians believe that the Jews are guilty of deicide. What is deicide? You heard of a uh, heard of suicide, right? You heard of homicide? Suicide to kill oneself. Homicide to kill another person. Deicide means to kill God. This is Christian theology. It's not a joke. It's what they believe. It is kind of funny though, I have to admit it. But they believe God is dead. God died. God was dead in his tomb for three days. Right? And this is very interesting because one of the qualitative attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Judaism as well as Islam is that he is hayyun, la yamut. He, he lives, he never dies. Because that's part of his nature, right? Remember when the Prophet says that passed away? Abu Bakr Siddiq, what did he say? Man kana ya'mudu Muhammadan, fa innahum qad mat. When man kana ya'mudu Allah, fa innahu hayyun la yamut. If you worship the Prophet said that, he has passed. If you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's alive, he never dies. Right? So one time I was in this debate with this Christian scholar. He had a PhD in Christian theology. And I said, when God is dead in his tomb for three days, Who's running the heavens and the earth? You know what his response was? He said it was on cruise control. <laughs> this is what he said. It was on autopilot. Cruise control. Right? And this is what Christian theology believes, actually. They believe that there's secondary causation, without getting too technical here. But basically, uh, God created natural law, and he sort of sets it in motion, and it goes by itself. So he's somewhat removed unless he wants to interject. But our theology is that everything is caused directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no secondary causation. Anyway. So he doesn't perish. He doesn't become obsolete. He doesn't become phased out. He doesn't become extinct. Right? And then he says, What I yakunu illa ma yurid. Nothing happens except by his irada except by his will. And will is a qualitative attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, imaginations, right? Awham, imaginations cannot contain him. And afham, comprehensions, cannot uh, perceive him. So you can sit down for hours and hours and think, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And whatever you think about is ultimately incorrect. So it's a big waste of time. In fact, it's haram to actually do that. We don't think about what is Allah essentially. We can think about who is Allah in the form of his actions. What does Allah do for us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of those who show mercy. There was a ghazwa at one time, a military expedition. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was there with a group of Sahaba. And they saw this woman suddenly come out of her house and she was hysterical. If she had lost her little son, right? Her little toddler was lost. Running around, she's historic, screaming, where's my son, where's my son? She picks up her son, and she starts to kiss him, and hug him, and starts to breastfeed him, right? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, So can you imagine this woman throwing her son in a fire? So, قُلْنَا We said, لَا وَاللَّهِ We cannot imagine this woman taking her son, that she's hugging and kissing and squeezing and throwing him into a fire. Right? And then he said, Allah arhamu bi ibadihi in hadihi bi waladiha. Allah is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her son. Right? So these are things we should think about. We don't think about what does Allah look like? Where is Allah? This question is immediately incorrect because there is no where with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where is called Tarfu makan. Allah does not have a mechanic. 
When is Allah? When is hope? Tharfu Zaman. There's no Zaman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's utterly inconceivable. So it's actually haram to think about these things. Because you won't understand anyway. Right? What do we think about? We think about the ni'am, the blessings, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Right? Think about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are upon us. And the blessings are innumerable. Creatures do not bear any similarity with him. Right? He is completely dissimilar his creation. That's why we can't make you know, paintings and iconography. Like if you go into a church, you find all this iconography in the church. I remember one time I was in a church with another brother. We're doing an interfaith dialogue. The Catholic Church. So there's, you know, there's stations of the cross. There's like life-size images of Isa Alayhi Salaam holding a cross and crucified on a cross. So we had to pay maghrib. So they cleared the altar for us. But there's like all of these images in front of us. So I said, you can pray on our altar. So I looked at the brother and he looked at me. And we're looking at each other. And uh, they're waiting for us to start our prayer. So immediately, almost instinctively, we ran out. We just started running. We ran outside, and immediately outside we started praying. And then this, I remember this one lady was so offended. She said, what are you guys doing? This is the house of God. We had to explain to them, you know, these are, these are images, and, and uh, we can't pray in front of them, and things like that. But it was interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> so he bears no similarity. And then he says here, <laughs> we talked about that. He is alive, he doesn't die. Uh, he is all sustaining, self sustaining. He doesn't sleep, right? He doesn't feel fatigue, right? He's not overcome with sleep or fatigue. Uh, he is a creator without need, right? Uh, he is a provider without any kind of storehouses or budget, limited resources. You know, like if we want to uh, support something or give money to someone, we have a budget. It's a limitation. Even if you're a billionaire, you have a limit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any type of limit or budget. Okay. And then he says, he sees his life without fear and resurrects without effort. Just as he was possessed of his attributes prior to his creation, so he remains with the same attributes without increasing in them as a result of his creation coming into being. We'll talk about this, inshallah. He had all of these attributes uh, forever. And he was described by the attribute al-Khaliq before he even created anything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he created anything, he still called al-Khaliq. Because he has that potential to create. The potentiality is still there. You guys can skip around a little bit. This gets a little difficult. It requires a lot of explanation. And then he says that That is because he has power over all things. What kind of shaykh ilayhi? Faqir. Right? And everything is dependent upon him. So again, Anyone who claims to be God, the very fact that a human being is claiming to be God is immediately a proof that that person is not God. Why? Because a human being is always dependent on things. Right? A human being is dependent on many things. On food, on water, on gravity, on sunlight, on the moon, on clothes, on the weather. Right? This could not be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a Christian, for example, Christians are very uh, aggressive sometimes in their da'wah, the Muslims. If you go to a public school uh, and there's a group of Christians there and they, uh, they find out that you're Muslim, it's like their ears will light up. Oh, Muslim. They come up to you, who's God? You say, Allah. You say, who's Allah? What are you talking about? Right? Allah is blah, 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 blah. They start making these things up. Right? God is Jesus. That's what they say. So don't you believe God is... In, independent of everything. And they say, yes. So, okay, Jesus is dependent on food, on water, on gravity, on sunlight, on all of these things. 
So what kind of God is this? You worship a God that has limitation. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no limitation. As soon as we can as soon as we can prove that someone has a limitation, they're automatically disqualified as being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as being a God in any sense. Everything is easy for him. He doesn't need anything. There's nothing like him while he is the all hearing and the all seeing. I think we'll stop at this point with the text and try to take some comments or questions. If you have any questions regarding uh, the theology or the Akira, or if you have sort of you know questions about fasting, fifty type questions about about fasting, take the control. Yes, sir. So um, you said that as the word what is is uh wrong question to ask. How do you answer that when the kids ask that kind of question? That's a good question. Yeah, kids, kids ask these questions all the time. Where is Allah? You know, things like that. So, the way we talk to children is that we say that Allah's mercy, we stress Allah's attributes. Allah's mercy, Allah's love is here. Allah loves you, Allah cares for you, Allah is merciful. So concentrate on the, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, what is Allah? See, Allah is a God who loves you, who is merciful. He's Rahman al-Rahim. Talk about his attributes. That's the best way to do it. Right? They say, where is Allah? It's a difficult question to ask. Because the question itself is faulty. So if they ask this question, where is Allah? Then you say, Allah's mercy is everywhere. Allah's concern is everywhere. Right? And then ultimately, if they're kind of um, being smart aleck, they'll say, no, 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 where is Allah's essence? Right? If they ask that question, they say that this question has no answer. But usually children don't ask those types of questions. Rejoinder. Concentrate on Allah's attributes, His love, His person. This is the best way to talk to children about Allah. Allah. Yes? Yeah, God, one of the truths that Yes. And and he said, and he said, explain. I heard the word that is the first one of the father, the universal power, the universal knowledge, the universal mercy, all these things. Yeah, yeah, I had one of a kind. So like when Bilal was being tortured. The, the question is, uh, he's talking, he's defining the term Ahad. It wasn't really a question. But Ahad means all-powerful, all-merciful. All Basically, all of these attributes par excellence. Right? Basically, Ahad is one of a kind. So when Sayyidina Bilal was being tortured by Bayyid bin Khalaf, he was saying Ahad and Ahad, Sayyidina Bilal. He wasn't saying Wahid, Wahid. Because Umayyah would say, yes, Allah is Wahid, we believe that too. And he wasn't saying, Allah, 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 to say, yes, we believe in Allah also. But Ahad means that Allah is the only God. Right? That's it. He's one of a kind. No other God. Right? So this was seen as a threat to uh, the Jahari era. Uh, but yeah, you can, there's, there's massive commentaries written on sort of the flaws. Massive, massive commentaries. About what is Ahad? What does it mean to be Ahad? <laughs> Yes, what are some of the devices to strengthen the idea of our kids? Knowing that we don't, you know, our kids don't go to traditional kind of Islamic, you know, teaching that emphasizes the idea itself. So, just kind of to, to, to protect from them growing up in the future and missing all the technologies. Yeah. That's not what you want to know. Uh, I, my advice is children need to have a mentor. They need to have a mentor that's not quite as old as their father, but obviously not as young as they are. Sort of a go-betweener, right? That is kind of familiar with the context of the society. So that someone they feel really comfortable with, because 
uh, you know, when we used to do the youth halakha in the early a few years ago, we get youth that come in and ask us questions that would, they would never ask their parents. It's just out of the question. It, it would say things to us that would never, because it would be total, basically, basically suicide if they, they approach their parents about certain things. So they'd ask us about them because they would feel more comfortable with us. And they ask us questions, you know, questions relating to, to everything, to, to society, to theology. They need to have that mentorship there, right? Um, I, I notice many Muslim youth are, are, are two-faced, many of them, that there's something at home with their parents, and then they go out with their friends, and they're completely different people, completely different. I've even seen this with Hafad al Quran. There are Hafad that go to university, and uh, they get addicted to drugs. And one time they came to a, a restaurant, and they were high as a kite, there's three of them, completely high. They had just smoked some marijuana. They're they're hafal of Quran, you know. So even they're not immune to this, right? So we talk to them. I'm not a hafal of Quran, but I was. They were a few years younger than me, right? So I said, "What are you guys doing? <laughs> You're hafal of Quran." So yeah, the pressures at school are so, you know, whatever, and we couldn't take it, and so on and so forth. So that's the most important thing is to have that mentor, and not just any mentor, you know, this goes to a baseball game, someone who's knowledgeable of the deen. So that this mentor can answer these tough theological issues, that the, the philosophical issues that these youth are hearing in high school and in college, that they won't approach their parents with, because number one, they think my parents don't, don't even know this stuff. My parent, my father, my mother, whoever is not even a, in a position to be able to answer these questions. Right? Uh, you know, how do you deal with Nietzsche's concept of the death of God? Uh, go pray. Right? Don't worry about these things. Because the focus on the immigrant community is more on orthopraxis. It's more on proper practice of the religion. Not on orthodoxy. Right? It's not on the Akita. Because we didn't have these issues back home. Back home, there were no atheists. You know? We didn't have the internet. I'm talking about like my parents' generation. The internet. It was a closed society. Everyone's basically Muslim. Questions were more fitly tied on. But now people are asking these deep philosophical, theological, challenging things. People go on, children go on online and listen to Richard Dawkins and you know, Christopher Hitchens, these atheists. And they're very persuasive. Some of them are very charismatic, they're very intellectual. And many of the youth are swayed by this. Right? They think, my father, he doesn't know anything. He has an accent. That's what they think. Obviously, that's not true. Just because you have an accent doesn't mean you could be a brilliant polymath. But the youth, they have, that's how they think. My parent doesn't know anything. My father, poor guy, he can't even speak English correctly. But this professor at school, who's an atheist, he has a PhD. He knows what he's talking about. Right? So they won't even approach the, the parents with these issues. There has to be a mentor. Right? Someone who knows the language, someone who knows the lay of the land, knows the context. This is why according to Sharia, a mufti cannot give a fatwa in a foreign country, even if he's Sheikh on Islam, even if he's Amir al right? He has to know the Zaman, the Makan, and the Insan of the context. He has to know the context of the people before he can even give a fatwa. Right? Um, so, you know, that's, that's really important for them. Joining the MSA, things like that are also important. Um, putting them in contact with, with scholars, introducing them to scholars. You don't have to be in direct contact with them. Because again, this is an age of technology, so you can take the courses online with with uh, you know qualified, authoritative scholars once a week, even. Because ninety nine percent of what these children are hearing in schools, they're not going to confide to their parents, and they hear some garbage. Trust me, they hear a lot of garbage. And I've even met youth that are just going through the motions now. They go to the masjid. And then privately they tell me, I'm not even Muslim anymore. I just got my father makes me go, I just go, just to make him happy. I go to the Janaza prayer. I don't believe in Allah anymore. I just go pray with him, because he wants me to go do it. So why don't you believe anymore? Yeah, it's something that I was taught when I was a kid, and now it's left in my heart. And I have bigger and better things to do now. And a lot of times it's the parents' fault. Because of the children, when they have this zeal for the religion, 
when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. The parents suddenly get scared. Oh, he's going to become a mobile. Don't worry about these things. Go get your PhD first. And then the, he gets his PhD when he's 35, 36 years old. And then his father says to him, okay, go to the masjid. I'm an atheist. What? How dare you? What happened? You told me not to go into these things. That's what happened. <laughs> this is very common, by the way. Very, very common. Right? If you have that zeal to live the religion, don't be afraid of it. Don't buy into Sarah Palin rhetoric. No, let them study the religion. They're not doing anything wrong. They have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're telling them, no, no, relax. Go, go chase the dunya for a while and then come back to the religion. But many of them, they, don't, they never make their way back. Yes? Much smaller age. When you cannot refer them to the two pockets at eight years old, is to set them so they can kind of deeper when they grow. Yeah, with younger, with younger children, uh, the best thing to do is like... Um, uh, kind of uh, connect their childhood memories with Islam somehow. Like one of my teachers once said, uh, and he's an old man, he said, one of my greatest memories was going fishing with my father. Right? And we would fish and then right at the edge of the lake we would pray our Asalat al So he makes this mental connection from a beautiful nostalgic memory from his childhood with something Islamic. Right? Or like, you know, take your son to a baseball game, football game, but somehow interject something Islamic about it. Like, do your prayer there, or make some zikr there, or talk about, have a conversation. That we, so they make those connections between beautiful childhood memories and Islam. In that case, and when that happens, uh, that love will never leave the child. The love of the deen. Right? So we have to be people that practice the religion as adults, as parents. We have to practice. We can't tell our, our children. The children are not stupid. We say, you know, what are you doing? Stop smoking. It's haram. Yeah. They say, well, you're smoking. It doesn't apply to me. Don't worry about me. I'm a bad example. I'm a bad example. You shouldn't smoke. <laughs> what are you doing? Get up and pray. But dad, I've never seen you pray. Don't worry about me. I'm a bad example. This type of thing. Kids are not stupid. You know what that child's going to do? He's okay, okay, I'm going to pray. Right? He's praying. The whole time he's thinking about uh, this girl or that video game or that hot dog, this pizza, this quarterback. That's his prayer. Why should he pray if the parents aren't doing it? So lead by example and, and you know, stamp these beautiful memories within the child's psyche, these nostalgic memories. One of my friends in college, uh, who was brought up in a very devout Muslim household, he actually left the prayer for a while and he was eating pork. And so what happened to you? And one of the things he mentioned to me was that uh, my father was too strict on me as a child. He would, he would kick me in the head to wake me up for fajr. And uh, he would never take me anywhere except the masjid. And he was very rude to me. And then when other people were, were, were around, suddenly he became the prophet. I said, I'm just smiling at people and, and very nice and gentle. And then we go home, we turn into Fir'aun. <laughs> so I said, yeah, but that's your father. That has nothing to do with your religion. He said, no, I, that's, that's what happened to me. I, I can't bring myself to pray because every time I make wudu, his face comes into my mind. And I don't want to pray anymore. So the kids make that connection from early childhood. So very young children, you know, take them to the fun places, like Islamic museums. They remember these things. Go to the, you know, uh, amusement parks and make sure that you pray there and have them pray with you. Don't be afraid of these, like, oh, there's non-Muslims around. They're going to make fun of me. Well, don't worry about that. You know, don't be negligent. Don't like, you know, get up in the middle of a, you know, tea party rally and do your salat al -asr. That's obviously to hear you negligent, right? But let them know that you're Muslim, you're proud, and, 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 and have those, those beautiful memories. Yes, sir? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. 
that sometimes will eventually threaten. Uh, what are like the Yeah. The question is about uh, praying behind the imam and any salat usually tawheer and the mind tends to drift. Well, drifting of the mind is 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 very, very common. It happens to everybody. One of my teachers actually said, You've know, you, you know you've attained wilaya, sainthood, when you can pray raka'atain and never once lose focus. Right. Everybody on this hero, what he <laughs> his point was 99.99% of human beings are going to lose focus in the prayer. But a way to bring someone back is before the prayer, you know how sometimes we start praying and then in our prayer we start worrying about things, right? If we have domestic issues, financial issues, whatever they are, if we're very busy, suddenly we're thinking about them in the prayer. So what you do before the prayer is Think about that very quickly and get it out of your mind. Right? You have to prepare yourself for the prayer. Think about these issues. You know, oh, you know, I have to, I have to pay the mortgage. Whatever it is, I have to call my mother in two weeks. I should do that. Get it out of your mind. And now you can be ready to pray and listen attentively to the Quran. Even if you don't understand, try to pick up some meanings. Right. Uh, but ultimately, we will we will drift. But the ulama say that uh, when you're standing in prayer, that on the day of judgment, we're also going to be standing in the same fashion, shoulder to shoulder with people. So some of the ulama say, think about the yom qiyamah. Right? And I've been in prayers uh, where you know I'm praying and I feel the need to yawn, and this is worth a hundred percent of the time for me, one hundred percent of the time. When I feel the need to yawn, immediately I think of the yawn tiyama, and my yawn goes away. Right? Or I start to drift a little bit, I think of the yawn tiyama, and I'm focused again. This, this works 100% of the time for me. Or even one time I had to go to the bathroom. And it's makru to pray when you have to go to the bathroom. But the prayer time is going to go out. So I started to pray, and as soon as I pray, I start to feel like I need to go to the bathroom. Immediately I thought of the Day of Judgment, and it was gone, the whole prayer Never came back to me. Right? So think about think about the Yom when you're standing before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's why you're holding your left hand because you want to receive the book with your right hand. Keep that left hand at bay. Right? Receive the book with your right hand, inshallah. Think about that day when you're standing before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because the prayer is a dress rehearsal for that. Right? That's why we pray because people who didn't pray on the Yom Al this is going to seem very strange. They have sure They can't even look up. They're standing next to people that are looking at them. It's very, very terrifying if you've never done that before. But we're trying to accustom ourselves to this type of uh, this type of standing on the Yom Kippur. Yes. When I go out for a travel or places like that, I tend, I try to hide my prayer from people. I think maybe it's a weakness of the mind. How do I overcome that? The reason I do that, I, I think that I'm not brave enough to take the wrong thing or somebody saying something. So I try to hide it all the time. No, it's, it's good to be discreet. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we should be like, we shouldn't make a spectacle of ourselves. Because then we're putting ourselves in harm's way. And some of the Urdu would actually say that's how I'll do that. Because people have real animosity you know, in this country. A few people have real animosity towards Muslims. And they're just looking for Muslims, right? So we should be discreet when we pray. We shouldn't, you know, be in people's faces. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, He mentions that He loves, uh, He loves this attribute of Muslims that fulfill their responsibilities and they don't care about the opinions of creation, right? But that's taken with a grain of salt, obviously. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Put the hakul kana murra, wa la taqaf fi Allahi lama tanaim." Speak the truth even if it's bitter, and don't be afraid of the reproaches of human beings. That doesn't mean we put ourselves in harm's way, right? Because they were being negligent. And that can, again, according to some of the ulama, it's, it's impermissible to put yourself in danger like that. So I would recommend, actually, that when you have to pray, find a clean place that's discreet, right? 
that's the five minute. It also helps your concentration, is if you're praying on the side of the street and cars are swimming by, you're going to be thinking about who's going to throw their car radio at me, who's going to yell something at me. So the whole time you're sort of in fushur, in fear of, of, of khala, and not of al khala. So that's also problematic. You know? But if there's no other place to pray, and you can't leave the room or something, then, you know, like you're, you're, you're in an airport or something like that. Right? If you're in an airport, um, uh, some, some airports, I was surprised, Houston Airport, George W. Bush International Airport actually has a prayer chapel. I was very surprised. I walk by and I can just do my prayer here. And I go inside and there's, I see people kneeling and there's a, there's a, a, a brother making such a, it says even Oakland doesn't have a prayer chapel, but George Bush International apparently has a prayer chapel. So um, be just be cautious about things like that. Be wise about it. It's not a deficiency in your iman. Not wanting to show off or think no one. Or you know, <coughs> wanting to be discreet is not a weakness of the iman, inshallah ta'ala. We should be discreet. <coughs> the Odom also I read this in the interest recently that there's actually a difference of opinion about using the honk of your horn. Whether we talked about this last night, that in, we come to the masajid and we have kushur in the prayer, and then we go outside the parking lot and we're honking at each other. Some of the ulama actually say it's haram to touch your horn. Why do they say that? Because they say that it's clearly a breach of your sabah, that you're showing impatience and animosity towards another human being, especially if they're Muslim. So they say you can only do it for ten beat. You can just beep beep if someone's like stopped at a red light or looking at their phone and then turns green. Just to let them know, okay, you can go now. Right? But honk, like this type of thing. Many don't know say this is impermissible to do. This is something else they mentioned. The sign of the of khushur, a uh, sign of lack of khushur in the prayer is impatience after the prayer. Right? People who are impatient after them just want to get out of the masjid, that's a sign that they were impatient in the prayer. Oh, I'm glad it's over. I gotta get out of here. Let me go. Let me go. And they have their bad moods. Right? Also, a sign of lack of mature in the prayer is that when he's at home alone, he prays like a chicken. A chicken pecks the ground. This is such that a very good prayer, right? And he's praying and the TV's on too, so he can hear the news at the same time. So he's hey, saying, kill two birds with one stone. I can listen to the news and I can pray like a chicken. But when it comes to the masjid, when there's other people watching, oh, mashallah, he's young, Sheikh of Islam, he's got them straight back from Ruku. He's there for about two minutes. He's got the deep such that you can hear his, his heart and then he's raising his voice a little bit. You know. have to watch out for these things. It's a sign of hypocrisy and lack of kushur. That our prayer at home, when nobody's around, could be exactly the same as the prayer in Muslim. There's no difference. We'll be next week, inshallah, after the Lord again. We'll do a little bit of the text. Any other questions or comments that you may have? And before we move on to the text, maybe some background information might be in order regarding the creed. There were some questions last time. You know, what is the creed? Why is it important? So the great, the great creedal articulators, there's three of them, right? According to the vast majority of scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Of course, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah uh, means the people of 
be prophetic precedent in the majority. You've always been the majority. That's why it's important for us to stay with the majority. There's an interesting statement attributed to Sayyidina Ali Karabala Buacha. It's mentioned uh, in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al Khulafa. Of course, we know Imam Suyuti, the great scholar from Egypt, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. But this is also mentioned in something called Nahjul Balagha, which is primarily a, a source for the, the Shia, but some of the Sunnis say that it's authentic, it's very spurious, there's no Sanad for many of the things, but this also mentioned, so mentioned in Sunni and Shia sources that the, that Imam Ali, he said, uh, that two groups of people, because of me, are destroyed, or on my account, are destroyed. It's a very interesting statement. Because the Prophet sallam, he said that Imam Ali, he said, you're similar to Isa alayhi salam. He would compare Sahaba, certain Sahaba, with certain Anbiya, because they have similar characteristics. Of course, nobody has a higher station than an Anbiya. In Imam Kahawi, he mentions that. Nabiyun wahid wa afdalu min jamir awliya. Right? One Prophet is greater than all of the saints. It's, that's ma'alum, that's known. So if he says, for example, that Sayyidina Umar is similar to Musa alayhi salam, because Musa alayhi salam, he had a lot of shidda, he was very strict. Uh, he's dealing with people that are very rebellious. And, uh, uh, Sayyidina Umar, very early on, he had a lot of shidda. He never lost his, you know, he was ambidextrous. Sayyidina Umar can write, read, he can write with both hands equally. Right? Because he has adala, he has balance even in his physical body. Right? Uh, and so he says, the Prophet said, he compared Isa alayhi salam with uh, Imam Ali. So Imam Ali says in the statement recorded in Nahjul Balagh, also in Tariq al Khalafa, two groups of people are destroyed because of me. He says, The one who loves me so much that his love carries him out of the truth. And he starts ascribing things to me that I do not merit. Right? So there are some people today, even to this day, who claim to be Muslim, and they say Imam Ali is a divine incarnation. They believe in something called Tejasim, right? which comes from the word Jasad. Jasad is a body. Right? Tejasim, also, you know, it's also called uh, Tashbir sometimes. Um, this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He comes down to earth and takes a human form. There are people who believe this. Obviously, all of the Christians believe this, right? At least the vast majority, this is the orthodox position of Christianity. Right? Their orthodox position, their, their relied upon position from their church councils and synods is that Isa salam, is not just the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is, in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is their orthodox with 95, 96, 97% of Christians they believe this. So Imam Ali says that group of people that love me so much, right? And it's it's love, but we have to be careful because you know the Prophet said, you are me, will you sin? He says, Your love for something will blind and death in you. If you if you're not grounded in your love, then you start saying things about your beloved that are not uh, correct, right? And there's, there's, there's allowance for, you know, people go into states and things like that. Some of the, uh, the people that are mystically inclined in our ummah, sometimes when they have a taste of what it means to, to actualize, you know, Allah's nearness to them. This is called the velk or tahqiq, right? That they actually have these uh, flashes of annihilation in, in God. That they start saying things. Uh, that uh, are outwardly kufur, right? <laughs> Blasphemous on the exoteric level. Uh, but on the inside, they're, they're, they're attempting to articulate a truth that is something that is impossible to articulate. Right? So people will say some things about the Imam Ali that are not true. And then he said, the second group is مُبْغِضُ الْمُفْرِدُونَ يَذْهَبُ بِهِ الْبُغْضِ إِلَى الْغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ He said, the one who hates me so much that his hatred takes him out of the truth. And then he said, the best position is the middle position. All right? The best position is the middle position. And he called it a salad al-a'adam, right? The great, 
big black thing, a sawad al right? And this is what Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah used to be called before this term was coined. Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah was called a sawad al And then he quotes the hadith, Yadullahi ala al Jama'ah, O Ma'a al Jama'ah. That the protective power, and we're talking about, you know, what do we do with verses in the Quran that mention God has a hand and a, and a shin and an eye? How do we do with these verses? Right? Uh, so, this is a big topic that's very important. These verses are called Al Mutashabihat. Right? From a theological perspective, um, they're very, very important to understand what's going on here, at least from a position of scholarship. How did the ulama, the vast majority of them, deal with these ayat. Anyway, he says the protective power of Allah is with the majority or is over the majority. So, when we're reading these creedal articulations of Abu Ja'far uh, uh, al-Tahawi or Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari or Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, these are the great formulators, they're attempting to articulate the religion of the Sahaba. That's the point of it. They're not making things up out of the blue. Right? That's why creedal literature, there's 130 statements in here. This is based on the strongest of sources, on the Qur'an, on multiply attested hadith, and ijma' of the salaf. Okay, ijma' of the salaf. It's different than sharia. Sharia, yes, Qur'an, you have hadith in general. You can, you can in, in, in uh, legislation, right, when you're, if you're a faqih, if you're uh, a, a jurist, you can take from hadith that are sound uh, as well as multiply attested. But in, in, in creedal literature, you, you use only the best of the best hadith, multiply attested hadith, or uh, if there's something just agreed upon by the, by the consensus of the salaf, the first three or four generations of the Muslims. And why is it important to study creed, aqidah? Why did they write down the Aqidah? Why not? Why, would, why did they decide to do that? The reason is because there are so many different groups of, you know, so-called Muslims that were saying different things about the Qur'an. You know, splinter groups here and there. Islam has not been immune to that. Right? Uh, that it necessitated these 4th century theologians to write down the creed, to articulate the religion of the Sahaba. Right? That's all they're doing. They're not, they're not making things up out of thin air. So they've done a service to us. We should respect scholarship. So last time we talked a little bit about... Um, he, talks, he begins by talking about ilahiyat, or uh, you know, theology. And then he goes on to nubuat, which is a prophetology. So remember, we talk about Allah, then we talk about prophets. Right? And as we said last week as well, you know, when we talk about Allah, everything is, you know, at best an inadequate approximation. At best, an inadequate approximation. At worst, totally wrong. We have to say something. <laughs> right. So he talks about the Prophet ﷺ. We believe in Muhammad ﷺ is the chosen one, the preeminent Prophet, his messenger with whom he is well pleased. Khatimul Anbiya. He is the last Nabi. He is the last Prophet. The difference between a Rasul and a Nabi. What is the difference? So a Nabi or a Prophet, Nabi is translated as Prophet, is someone who uh, receives a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he's not ordered to take the revelation public. Okay, that's one definition of a Nabi. Or someone who is inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to confirm the message of a previous Rasul, the Sharia of a previous Rasul. Okay? Or as a Rasul is someone who receives a Sharia, receives a revelation, and he's ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take it to the people. Okay? So with these definitions in mind, we see that every single Rasul is a Nabi. Every single Rasul is a Nabi. And according to the hadith of Ibn Hibban, and there's some weakness in the hadith, there is a hadith that says that there's 313 rusul, 313 rusul, and 124,000 anbiya. Okay? So a nabi is not necessarily a rasul, but a rasul is always a nabi. So the Prophet is the last of the prophets 
Right? He's the last of the prophets, which means also then he's last of the Rasul. There's no more. No one can can't come and say I'm a I'm a Rasul of Allah, and people have done that. Right? There's there's people who have done that, and even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's people Ablaha ibn Ka'ab, Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid, Sajjad bin Tulharith, Abdullah ibn Sa'id, Musaylim al Kadhab. Some of these are women. Musaylim al Kadhab claimed he was a prophet. Uh, and his, his, his wife also said, I'm a prophetess. Many of these people actually became Muslim. His wife, Sajja, actually became a Muslim after the Battle of Yamama. Um, but we don't accept anyone, anyone who, you know, what's his name, Mirza or Baha'u'llah, these, these people, Rashad Khalifa, right? this guy, founder of the 19ers, he came up with some mathematical code. And probably true, the Quran is, there's Ijaz in the Quran. The Quran is a miracle. And nobody doubts that. We have to believe that, actually. Uh, but, you know, this is why we shouldn't get carried away with any one science. So he's an you know, Egyptian scientist who was a numerologist. When you start getting into numbers, you start noticing coincidences. You, even if they're not there, you start putting things together. You literally will go insane. So this man, Rashad Khalifa, who used to go on tour with Ahmad Didak, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And Ahmad Dida would bring him on stage and he would, you know. And then one day, one of these events, he says, Rasha Khalifa says, I'm the Rasul of Allah. <laughs> there's actually a guy on, uh, there's a, there's, if you go to YouTube, there's a, on Peace TV, there's a big conference and this man got up to the microphone and he said, I have news, I'm the, I'm the Mehdi. And uh, everyone was laughing at him. He said, don't laugh at me, I'm the messenger of God. You can actually YouTube this. And he didn't know, he actually said, I'm the Mahindi, he pronounced it incorrectly. <laughs> and then uh, the speaker on stage, his Muslim brother, he said, uh, he said, if you're the Mahindi, then you, you can speak Arabic. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of people speak Arabic, but he knew that this man was an Arab, right? So he said, can you give us some Arabic? And he kind of froze, and then he said, A'uzu billahi bin ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he started reciting, you know, and, and, and then really, with a really bad touch, we... <laughs> And he said, no, that's, that's not enough. You're, you're not the, you know, the Mahdi. Some of my teachers, they, they get people all the time that come to, come to them and say, I'm Isa, they said, I'm the Mahdi. It's very common, actually. Very, very common. So people need to be grounded in, in the Aqidah. Mm-hmm. Imam al-Atqiyah, he is the Imam of the, of the righteous. Sayyid al-Mursaleen. He is the master of the messengers. Habibu Rabbil Alameen. He is... The beloved of the Lord of the world. So this is the station of the Prophet is the station of Mahabha, right? It's the highest station of any prophet. And that's part of our aqidah to believe that he's the best of creation. And there's yeah, actually some of the ulama actually say it's also part of the aqidah to believe that he's the most physically beautiful person. Some of them actually mention that as well, right? So we have to love the Prophet This is this is something that's far the ayn ala kulli muslim. Right? That you have to love him. With some type of love. Because there's... Mahabha is mahabhatain. There's two types of mahabha or love. There's mahabha which is aqli. Which is, a, you know, a love that's based on the rational faculty. Right? In other words, you love something because you know that you should love it. So, for example, if you have cancer, you know, a'udhu um, billah, we, we, we take, you know, chemotherapy, Right? Nobody likes to do chemotherapy. People get nauseated, and it's you know it's just it's a terrible experience. But I mean, they'll they'll gladly go and do it. Why? Because they know it's good for them. They love to do it, even though they don't like. It's kind of bitter, right? So Mullah Ali Qari uses that analogy in the Mirqat. It's like taking medicine that's bitter. You know, people become Muslim for different reasons. There are people who become Muslim because they study the Quran and they say this is the word of God, it has to be. And they don't even know anything about the Prophet. So he tells them, You have to love the Prophet. They say, I don't love him. I don't even know about him. Right? And if we say, Oh, you don't love the Prophet, then what we're doing is we're saying this person is a Catholic. If we say that somebody doesn't love the Prophet, we're making to feel of that person. Because you have to love the Prophet. So what's the answer? No, he does love the Prophet but it's a it's a love that's based on the intellect, right? It's not a love that's based on the qalb. So there's mahabba, aqli, and qalbi, right? Love based on the rational faculty, 
that you know you're supposed to love something because it will benefit you. And then there's love that's based on the heart. And this comes with time, especially for converts, right? That they get to know the Prophet Wasallam. So the mahabha that's qalbi is attained through ma'rifa, through gnosis, or getting to know who the Prophet Wasallam is, right? So this is very clear. There's, you know, different types of ayat in the Qur'an. And some of the ulama say there's seven types of verses in the Qur'an. Every verse will fall under one of these categories. Right? So there's ahkam. What is, what is ahkam? Hukum is Allah's telling you to do something or not to do something. And even in ahkam, there's different types. Ahkam, maliya, that re- relate to your wealth. Badaniya, that relate to your body. Qalbiya, relate to your heart. Right? Ahkam. And then there's ma'ad. Ma'ad is things that deal with the afterlife. Right? And then you have qasas, stories. Then you have rububiyah, things that deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabuwa, things that deal with the prophets. Then you have wa'ad. Wa'ad is a promise. Allah makes a promise in the Quran. That promise will come to pass. Allah never breaks his promise. And then you have wa'id, which is a threat. Right? Wa'ad and wa'id. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens the mu'min, he may forego his threat, and that doesn't take away from his majesty. Right? That's actually uh, that, that's a demonstration of his majesty. Right? Breaking your promise, obviously, this is called khiyana. Allah will never break his wa'ad. His promise is never broken. In Allah la yukhlifu mi'ad. Wa'ad Allahi haq. Wa man astaqu min Allahi qila. So if Allah makes a promise to a believer, you're going to go to Jannah if you do this and that, if you believe this and that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom Al-Qiyamah is not going to say, oh, I was, I changed my mind. Or I lied, I would have been left. If he makes a promise, you can take it to the bank, as they said. Right? If he threatens a believer, he may forego it. And that's an act of karam, of generosity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, a king has a law in the land. And the king says, whoever is caught stealing sheep, I'm going to cut off his hands. Right? So then this little boy is caught stealing sheep. Now the king can say, look, this is what the law says. This is the letter of the law. I don't care who you are, how old you are, what your circumstances are, cut his hands off. And that's justice. Because that's what the law says. The kid broke the law. But a generous king will say, oh, he's a child. Why were you stealing? My family is hungry. Oh, okay. You know. We'll pardon him. In fact, we'll give him the sheep and a couple more. Right? So that doesn't take away from the majesty of the king that shows his generosity. That he's for he's foregone, he's foregoing foregone is that even a word? Uh, his threat. Right? However, we have to be careful about that because some Muslims they say, Allah is Bafur Rahim, so I can do whatever I want. No, we don't we don't have this antinomian. It's called the Murjia. There's a group of Muslims that were deviant sect called al murjia right? the libertarians, the antinomians, that said things like, uh, the sharia is optional. You, know, you don't really have to, you really have to fast. No. You say, why don't you fast? Allah doesn't need my fasting. It's true. Allah doesn't need your fasting. You need your fasting. You need it. Allah gives a command and we do it. Right? Samiyana wa ta'ana. We hear and we affirm. Right? And they say things like, your actions don't increase your or decrease your iman. And that's that's not true. You know, that's not the position of the majority of scholars. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Tawbah, he makes a wa'id. He says uh, in meaning that if any of these dunyawi things, your fathers, your sons, your houses, your businesses, your spouses, any of these ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi any of these things in the dunya are nearer and dearer to you or beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger and struggling in His path, then just wait until Allah brings His decision. Right? Um, so this is called the wa'i. We don't want to wait. You know, this is a way of speaking. It's a rhetorical way of speaking. It's not like, okay, I'm just going to wait then. No, the point is, don't wait, right? Um, so we're obligated to love the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, if you look at some of the Sahaba, you know, manifestation of love, really, actually, you know, like when 
when kids go outside all day and they come home, the parents ask them questions like, where were you at? What did you do? You know, what happened? How long has it been since you brushed your teeth? When was the last time you took a shower? When the uh, people of Medina, when the children of Medina would go home, the first thing the parents would ask them is, how long has it been since you've seen the Prophet Sallallahu When was the last time you saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Oh, last week. Last week? Go right now and go look at him. Go find him right now. Just go look at him. And if you can talk to him, that's better. Okay? So like Hudayfa, who was raised, you know, as Muslims from a very young age, a great companion, Sayyidina Hudayfa, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So one time he came home and his mother said to him, when was the last time you saw the Prophet Right? Not where have you been, or you know, what, what did you do all day? And, you know, when was the last time you saw the Prophet So he said, uh, yesterday. And she said, Astaghfirullah, go right now. Because, you know, it's, you know, it's also time. And you haven't seen him the whole day? What are you doing all day? Go look at him right now. Right? So he goes to the masjid, and it's Maghrib time now. And the Prophet Sallallahu is there in the masjid, and he's approaching him, and then suddenly he's swarmed. If you ever like been to like Tirim, you know, I've studied in Tirim. Happy Ramadan has been here before. And, uh, you go into the Dar, and there's just people swarming over him. You know, it's really difficult to get to him. Right? You have to sort of catch him at a, coming out of his house or something. <laughs> so Hudayfa, he said, you know, I can't get to him. So they prayed the Maghrib, and he said, okay, I'll wait till after Maghrib. Right? So he's sitting in the front row and. He said the Prophet said, so after he led the thought, he got up and prayed Raka'atayn, 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 Raka'atayn. He said, this continued until the Adhan of Isha. <laughs> so he said, well, I have to wait until after Isha now. My mom's going to worry about me. Well, David was very young at this time. So uh, he said that then he prayed Isha, uh, and then he prayed the Sunnah after Isha. And then he said, right after the Sunnah, I tried to rush, and then all of these Sahaba came, and they were like pushing me and they were, they were, you know, touching him, shaking his hand and, and asking him questions and swarming around him. So he said, I couldn't, I couldn't. Because his, his mother said, not only, you know, don't just go out and look at him, but ask him to pray for you and for me. This is what Hudayfa's mother told him. I don't think I mentioned that. So he said, go look at the Prophet and ask for his dua. Ask him to, to ask Allah to forgive our sins. Right? <laughs> So Hudayfa, you know, he's, he's getting frustrated. And finally he says, the Prophet said, just rushed out of the masjid. He rushed out of the masjid. And he's walking down the, the street. And he's Hudayfa, he said, he was following his footsteps behind him. Following his footsteps. And he suddenly, iltafata, he turned around suddenly. And he started walking towards me. And he said, man ladhi ja'abik, ya Hudayfa. He said, what has brought you out here? He said, ghafrallahu lak wa liwani he said, may Allah forgive you and your mother. <laughs> and, and then he said, that's, that's all I wanted. That's why I was following you around. The Prophet said, he noticed Hudayfa was following him, was watching him, all these things. It's the type of love they had for the Prophet So, um, <clears throat> this is something that is, that is fought. قَلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبِكُمُ اللَّهِ in what in kuntum in is called harf shart is a uh, conditional particle, right? And in English we say it's the if clause in English grammar. Maybe some of the shabab can help us. When you give a conditional statement, there's an if clause and a then clause. In English, in technical uh, grammatical language, it's called the protasis and the apotasis. In other words, if you do this, then I'll do that. Right? First you have to do something, then I'll do this. So, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you love Allah, fattabi'uni. You have to follow me. Yuhbidkum Allah. Then, right? Yuhbid, there's a sukun, it's called jazm bit talab, al jazm bit talab. Right? This is a, the effect of this is it's a purpose clause. So that, or in order that, Say, if you love Allah, follow me. In order that Allah might love you. So, the mahabba of Allah is not something that is freely given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
This is the difference we have with our Christian brethren who say the love of God is unconditional. The mercy of God is unconditional. We believe that. Allah gives his mercy to whomever he wills. Right? And mercy is akin to love. Some say it's actually the same thing. But, but mahabba, technically speaking, is a station to be attained with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it becomes problematic then from a Christian perspective. If God loves everybody, even those who are in rebellion against him, then why does God put someone that he loves into Jahannam forever and ever and ever? It's very problematic for the Christian. Right? God takes someone he loves unconditionally and puts him, because they believe in, in fire, in Jahannam, and that people Khalid and Fiha will forever be in fire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes someone he loves unconditionally and he puts him into Jahannam. That's like a, a man, a husband punching his wife and saying, I'm doing this because I love you. Bam! And punching his wife. Is this a love? This is, this is someone who is, he's lost it. Right? Anyway. So then he says, Any claim to prophecy after him is uh, deviation and heresy. So all these people, Sayyidina Ghulam, Nirza, Rashad Khalifa, anyone who claims to be Mahdi or Mahindi or whatever they're claiming to be, all of these people are liars, or they're very much deluded. Right? <clears throat> so he is the emissary to all of the jinn and the whole of humanity with truth and guidance, with light and radiance. So there's a few things though. The thing about this creed is it's not very organized. That's one downfall of the creed is he doesn't deal with topics. Um, he doesn't exhaust a topic and then move on to another topic. He kind of switches, you know, back and forth. So he, he stops talking about prophecy here and then he moves on to Iman. Right? Um, so he starts talking now here about the Quran. So it's very difficult to understand this. You know, that's why this has to be, you know, studied with a, with a teacher. The, the Quran is the word of God that emanated from Him without modality in its expression. What does that mean? Bila kafiya. So this is something that, you know, for the for the awam for the lay Muslim, we say that we pick up a mushaf, right? A mushaf is a copy of the Quran. And we say, Hada kalamullah. Right? This is majazan. When we say that, this is figurative. Because the kalam of Allah is uncreated. But what we have in the mushaf is something created. A mushaf is something created, right? It's paper, it's ink. Arabic is created, it's a language, right? So when we say that the mushaf, the physical book, is the kalam of Allah, we don't mean this haqiqi. This is not literal. It's majaz, it's figurative. And it's permissible to say that because uh, the vast majority of people, um, they're not going to understand these things at a very deep level. So it's permissible to say that. But in a teaching sort of environment, you know, when the ulama talk about the uncreatedness of the Quran, they're talking about pre-eternal meanings that are reflected in the mushaf. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his speech does not have salt, it doesn't have sound, my speech has sound. He doesn't speak in a particular loha language, because language is created, right? He doesn't, you know, have syntax, he doesn't have, you know, morphology, salt and nahu. These are things that were created by human beings. The actual speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amodal. Amodal means there's no how, you can't describe it in any way, it's impossible for you to try to articulate. So the ulama say, al-mawjood fil mushaf dalla ala kalamillah nafsi wal qadim. What is present in the mushaf indicates upon the pre-eternal uh, and personal speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we talk about the kalam of Allah, we're talking about pre-eternal meanings, right, that are infinite. One of my teachers explained it like this. He said, what we have in the Qur'an is Allah's translation of those pre-eternal meanings. Allah's choosing the Arabic letters. Right? 
Allah's choosing the Arabic which is created, choosing the letters, the words in Arabic, articulating in Arabic uh, some of these pre-eternal meanings. Um, so this is, I mean, for us it's not a big issue, but apparently uh, at the time of the great Aimma, this was a major controversy because, you know, there's a group of Muslims called the Murtazila, rationalists, who said the Quran is created. And so the Ahl Sunnah would, would clarify. Um, there's a story of Imam Sha'bi or Shafi'i. There's the same story is attributed to two men, and their names sound the same Sha'bi and Shafi'i. Right? So that's where the confusion probably comes. But I think it's Imam Shafi'i, because Imam Sha'bi. Uh, it's a little too early, I think. So what happened was Imam Shafi'i, he was summoned to the, the court of the Caliph, who was a, he was a rationalist, his Mu'atazili. Um, and this Caliph, he would punish scholars who used to teach that the Quran is uncreated. This is a major issue for them, apparently, at the time. Not a really big issue for us today. Um, but, so anyway, he summons Imam Shafi'i, and he says to the Imam, he says to Imam Shafi'i, he says, is the Qur'an makhluq or qadim? Is it created or is it pre-eternal? Right? So he's, he, wants to, he wants to know what Shafi'i's opinion is. Imam Shafi'i knows that if he says, oh, the Qur'an is qadim, then this, this caliph is going to capture him and probably torture him. Ahmad ibn Muhammad was tortured. All four of these imams spent time in prison. Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, all four of them did time in prison. One of them died in prison, right? Because of the, um, because of their opinions. Um, anyway, so Imam Shafi, uh, he says, Al Quran is what he does. He goes, Al Quran. He gives a, he says, A Torah was Zabur, Wal Injil, Wal Quran, Kulluha Makhluka. So he says, he says the, the Torah, the the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran, all of these are created. And the caliph says, Ah, oh, mashallah. You know, I've heard rumors about you. I guess they were incorrect. Go and teach your students. He's up there, just up there. He goes. So then, then his students hear about it. Imam Shafi's students hear about this. And they said, we heard, a, we heard something. You said the, the Quran is created. And Imam Shafi says, Astaghfirullah. And then ever since this. So yeah, you did. So no, no, no. So yeah, you were questioned by the caliph. So no, let me show you what I did. I said, the Torah and the Zawur and the Injil and the Quran, Kullu ha, my fingers, all of these fingers, Kullu ha, makhluqa. That's, that's what I meant. He misunderstood me. So that's Imam Shafi for you. Very, very clever. <laughs> anyway, so you know the, the ulama use different analogies, and you know when we talk about analogies, we have to be careful. But if we're talking about theology, then we have to use analogies. So we say, "What in method is a'la?" With Allah is the greatest analogy. But you know the ulama use things like you know if you're a, a mother who's speaking to her child who's very young, let's say the child is you know a toddler and he's you know doing things that are inappropriate. The mother doesn't say, let's sit down and have a conversation about this. So let's think about why you're doing this. Um, don't you know it's inappropriate for you to put uh, forks into the light socket? Because the child will say, huh? Huh? Mommy? No, you say, no, 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 no. Right? When you talk to the child, no, 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 Right? It's just an analogy. So, in other words, the mother has to condescend, speak the language of the inferior intellect in order to have the child understand, right? So, when we talk about kalam Allah, we talk about the kalam of Allah that is qadim and nafsi, his personal speech, no one can understand that because it's not in human language. But his kalam lafzi, his articulated speech is reflected in the Quran and we can understand that. Because Allah chose the Arabic words, right? By which to, to articulate some of these pre-eternal meanings of the Quran. Or they say you're driving down the street, and there's a deer in the road, right? 
You don't walk out of your car and say, hello, Mr. Deer, you need to move now because my car is going to hit you and then you're going to die or be severely injured. Because the deer is going to say, what? What are you not even going to understand what you're saying, right? But if you get in the car and go, bah, 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 uh, the deer will run away. So you have to speak the language of the inferior intellect. In order for the inferior intellect to understand your language, you have to condescend to their level. Walillahi al-mathal al-a'la. It's just an analogy. So make us understand, inshallah, a little bit closer. <clears throat> so, bila kafiyya qawlan. No modality in its, in its expression. Right? Um, so the Prophet ﷺ, when he recites the Qur'an, he's reciting obviously the Qalam, the Qalam Lafti, he's reciting the Arabic Qur'an. But as he's reciting, this is why he, re he repeat verses over and over and over again. Right? Like Aisha says that he repeated the end of Ma'idah. In tu'adhikum fa'indahum ibaduk, wa in ta'gfir lahum fa'indahum antal azizul hakim. He repeated this verse uh, for the entire night. This one verse, the entire night. The reason why he's doing that is because, according to the ulama, the pre-eternal meanings of this verse are coming into his heart. He's receiving openings, a futuhat, in man, in meanings. Openings in meanings as he's reciting. That's why you should recite the Quran slowly and try to understand because then you start having these breezes of understanding in your prayer, right? But oftentimes when we're reciting, even if you don't understand the Qur'an, there, there are Arabs who, who, who recite the Qur'an and they understand the meaning of the translation. They understand it's their language. But they don't understand what exactly is the meaning of the Kalam. The big meaning with a big M. That this is the speech of God, right? They don't understand the meaning, or they're not, they're not realizing that meaning but the actual meaning of the ayat they're understanding because they're Arab. And oftentimes the ajam, right, he understands the big M, that this is the kalam of God, right? So in his prayer he has khushur. But if you ask him, what's the translation? I have no idea. I don't know, even know what I'm saying. How can you have such khushur in your prayer? Because I understand that this is the Qur'an, right? So that's what's affecting him. So we should have, we should have both. We should understand what we're saying, because if we understand what we're saying, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, even if we don't understand, inshallah, we pray that Allah gives us openings in the meanings, and the meanings are infinite. They're infinite. This is why the Prophet said, you know, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. We have expanded your sadr, because the Quran is revealed to the qalb, and the qalb is in the sadr. So the chest is that which encloses the, the heart, right? So it preserves the heart. Uh, so, so one of the meanings of this, you know, nashrah, you know, sharh means to explain something, right? to explicate upon something. So the Prophet ﷺ was given these these meanings of the Quran. He can he can he has the best ability to explain what the Quran actually means. Right? So that's uh, that's one of the meanings of Adam nashrah naka sadrak. That not only have we given you the Quran and you're reciting it, you know what it means better than anybody else amongst the creation. But nobody knows all of the meanings except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's just impossible for any human being to have something that's infinite like that. Nobody has anything infinite qualitatively. Infinite, infinitude belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنزَلَ عَلَى نَبِيِّهِ وَحْيًا It was revealed, sent down upon his prophet as a revelation. Then he continues, the believers accept it literally. They are certain it is in reality the word of God, the sublime and exalted. It is not the speech, it is not created like the speech of, of human beings. Abu Bakr al-Bakalani, who is a great scholar of Ash'ari, he was a student of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. Unfortunately, Imam Ash'ari today is much maligned a lot of Muslims don't like Imam Ash'ari. Very strange to me, white people. Uh, they, they have problems with Imam Ash'ari. It's nothing. It is, traditionally, that was not that was not even the case. Not even close. Even even you know Ibn Taymiyyah praises Abu Hassan al Ash'ari. But anyway, one of his students was named Abu Bakr al Bakalani. He was a great preserver of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And Abu Bakr al Bakalani, he says that. 
if you look at poetry, right, um, there are weak verses and there are strong verses. What does he mean by that? He means that in poetry there are some verses that can be improved rhetorically, right? If you just sort of isolate that verse, you can say it in a slightly better way. But the reason that the poets have to use weak verses is because they, they have to have a certain meter that they have to agree with, right? There's a certain meter in, 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 in poetry. Um, these are called bihar in Arabic. There's like 16 or 17 bihar, you know, meters of poetry uh, that they have to abide by, right? So, but if you take one of these weak verses out of a poem, you can actually improve it rhetorically. But he says with the Qur'an, there are no weak verses. Nothing in the Qur'an can be improved rhetorically. In other words, there's no, any verse in the Qur'an, there's no way to improve any verse in the Qur'an. It's say it in a, in a way that's more rhetorically sound. The Qur'an is perfect rhetoric. Right? So this, this is not how a human being speaks, and it's not poetry. Because in poetry, you're going to have weak verses. Because you need the meter to line up. Right? And in poetry, you have sajah. Sajah means the end rhymes, right? And once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, right? That's called sajah. Uh, so the Quran has sajah, but it it's not poetry because it's rhetorically perfect, right? So it's not poetry. It's not the speech of human beings. And people who, you know, non-Muslim Arabs who study this, they admit the Quran is the, the pinnacle of any type of Arabic literature. There was no, you know, the equivalent of the Arabic Iliad or Odyssey, anything like that before the Quran. There was nothing written before the Quran. There was poetry, but that's it. فَمَنْ سَمِعْهُ فَزَعَمَ أَنَّهُ كَلَامُ الْبَشَرُ فَقَدْ كَفَرُ Whoever hears the Quran and claims that it's the speech of a human being has disbelieved. <clears throat> For God has rebuked and censured and promised such a one an agonizing punishment. I will roast him in hellfire. In هذا إلا قول البشر These are verses from the Quran. That we know, we acknowledge that it is the word of the creator of humanity. It does not resemble human speech. This is very, very important. We'll finish with this. Whoever describes Allah with human characteristics has disbelieved. This is why we have to be careful when we approach hadith, that, that there are certain things mentioned in hadith that we cannot possibly take literally. Because then, we put ourselves in the dangerous position of tajzim, of, of ascribing human or created characteristics to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we have to use aqal. Right? One of my teachers complained that many Muslims are naqal heads. There's aqal and naqal. Right? There's intellect and there's a revelation. The knuckle head is someone who takes a hadith and doesn't apply his intellect. And then by doing so, he makes grave errors in ascribing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala physical characteristics, which is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have, because Allah is independent of everything. For example, there's a hadith, sound hadith, in the last third of the night, Ar-Rahman descends to the Sama'u dunya and he asks, who is making tawbah that I may forgive him? You take this hadith literally, what does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala physically descends uh, to the salam of dunya, the last third of the night. Some people take it like that. But the problem with that is what? If you apply the aqal, it's always the last third of the night somewhere. Right? Always. You go to, you go to places around the earth, always it's the last third of That means Allah is always in the salam of dunya. Astaghfirullah. No, Allah is not, there's no enclosure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not in time, He's not in space, because that would make Him dependent on time and space. This is called dahar. Dahar is a time-space continuum. Allah transcends space-time. Right? Or, you know, the Quran says, Allah is folk ibadi. He's above. Folk means above. And the knuckleheads, they say, Allah is above us physically. Well, our up is China's down, right? And China's down is China's up is our down. So what up are you talking about? So you apply the the aqal. It's impossible for that to be literal. So how do we deal with these verses? 
that seem to indicate, because again, speech is an approximation, right? When we talk about Allah, all speech is approximation. How do we deal with these verses? The Salaf, they deal with these verses. So, for example, when we said, Yad Allah, right? Yad in Arabic means hand. So, how do the ulama deal with this verse? There's two schools of thought. There's the madhab of the salaf, the first three or four generations, who would say, when you come across a verse like this, you make something called tafwid. Tafwid. This means to leave the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just leave the meaning. This is, there's a few steps to this. Step number one, when you hear something like that, completely disassociate your mind with anything physical. Completely disassociate. Because we hear yet, I think this is a yet. No, completely disassociate your mind with anything physical. The second step is, co-sign the meaning. Resign the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what it means, and it means whatever is proper to His greatness and majesty. Step number three, affirm tanzeel, transcendence. That Allah laysa kamithbihi shaykh. This is what the salaf would do. The salaf, including sahaba. They didn't have these conversations about is it a yad, is it fingers, does he have fingernails, is it, is it germ, is it skin? Is it? They didn't have these conversations. It didn't even occur to them. This is what the salaf would do. Co-sign the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what it means. Right? It cannot possibly be literal because Allah is similar to his creation. However, over time, because you have you know, these different Muslim groups, the Mujassima was a group that said that Allah actually you know, has a physical body and very kind of Christian, literal reading of the Quran and Hadith. Uh, so, Ahlul Sunnah, they would start to make ta'wil. Right? Ta'wil is the best. Leave the meaning to Allah. Allah knows what it means, and halas, that's it. Allah is, there's nothing like God. Allah knows what it means. The other school of thought is called ta'wil, which means you interpret the verse, but you do it in a way that in which you maintain the transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, Ibn Abbas, who's actually from the Salaf, but he would make ta'wil. He would say something like, Yadullah means the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's not a physical thing. The protection of Allah, but then he would say, Allah Adam, Allah knows best, and um, that's just a possible meaning, and laysa kim is shape. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But nobody, no scholar in the history of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah said, yes, Yadullah means a physical hand, and there's five fingers. I mean, this is all, yani, according to the classical scholars, this is kufur to say something like this. <clears throat> but, you know, nowadays, Muslims say the strangest things. They don't study the, the classical understandings. And um, unfortunately, they have sort of these weird ideas. They ask Imam Malik about Istawa al Arsh. This is a favorite verse of some Muslims. So, Istawa al Arsh. Istawa al Arsh. Allah is seated on the throne. Istawa means julus. One of the meanings is to sit. So they came to Imam Malik, right? This type of Muslim who believes in Tajaseen. He came to Imam Malik and said, Tell us about Istawa al Arsh. And he said, Al Istawa ma'alum. Wa kayfa khayra ma'akul. Wa su'al anhu bid'a. He said, Istawa is ma'alum, meaning that in the Quran we believe it's known, Istawa. He said, Wa kayfa and how it is, is, uncom- is incomprehensible to you. Don't even think about it. Just make tough wheat. Leave it for Allah. Why are you asking about this? What is it really going to, how is it going to impact you? Why are you asking? And then he said, and su'al anhu bid'ah. Asking about it is actually bid'ah for your information. Because the Sahaba didn't ask about these things. Why are you asking about these things? Right? So I said, you know, he's sitting on a physical throne. So okay, the last third of the night when Allah descends, is he sitting on his throne? I say, uh, yeah. So if the throne is like an elevator? No, 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 no. He leaves the throne. So the throne is above Allah? No, 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 no. 
I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So we don't describe human characteristics to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is what the Christians have done. Okay? Just like we don't say the Prophet is the Son of God or Allah or He died for your sins. In the same way, if you describe Allah or if you say something like, well, Allah has a makan, but it's nothing like our makan. Right? So then the question is, okay, if that makan wasn't there, whatever it is, is there still Allah? Does he need this makan then? No. He doesn't need the makan. So why are you ascribing him makan? Oh, I don't know. Does he need the makan? He needs the makan. Then Allah is needing? No. no. Wait a minute. I don't know. <laughs> Just make tough weed. I don't know. It's, it's whatever it means. Allah knows what it means. It doesn't concern him. <clears throat> I think we should stop, inshallah. Next time we'll talk about, he talks about the beatific vision, the ru'ya. Of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we see Allah? Right? This is another issue. Is it even possible to see Allah? How do you see Allah? With your eyes, with your ruh, with your essence. Is it mentioned in the Quran? You know, this type of thing. Any questions before we Yes sir? You mentioned this for you.